We're talking today about loving others. And um, if I may start by saying, shall we try to define what that looks like? So what does look, love look like to you? Is it always the same? Does it come through different avenues? Does it, does it get demonstrated differently? Or do we receive it differently? Depending on where our hearts are at, how do we, how do we receive it? So we sometimes misconstrue love by personalities and the way it's delivered, the expression of love. So can we start by saying that love is not about a person's personality or how they express it? Because we just never know what's going on in a person's heart. But there are different ways that we can express love to, to people, to the people around us, um, even to virtual strangers, to our families, to our church families, and our community. Let me give you a couple of examples. So if we think about Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa was very loving. And how did she love? Mother Teresa loved from a heart of mercy by caring for people. Uh, there's also Corrie ten Boom. How did she love? She was a woman of enduring faith, and she loved through forgiveness. And then we've got Dr. Martin Luther King. How did he love? He was very loving. He loved through fighting for justice for others. So love can look different for different people, and it can be demonstrated and expressed differently. We just need to learn how to receive it. So there's a two-way, there's a two-way street here of giving and receiving and how we give and how we receive. Personally, for me, I, um, I had this journey of loving others was a little bit, a little bit trying for me at times. And I'd have to say that I am probably a little bit more like Dr. Martin Luther King. I will, I will come beside you. I will fight for you. I'm a justice fighter. I'm justice minded. And sometimes I don't always express it in the right way. And even when I expressed it, I stepped out and expressed it sometimes uh, because of hurt, because there were times where I was betrayed. There were times where, um, you know, I gave love and um, it was not received. It impacted the way that I expressed it. And um, it, it had, I had to be intentional and to really get into the Father's heart for Him to help me to do this. And in so doing, He started to show me what the spiritual gifts that I have that He wanted me to use to express love for others. So I would say that I'm probably um, not as mercy-minded as, as some, and uh, I'm not as probably, I don't have the greatest gift of hospitality, but in spiritual gifts, I'm motivated by healing. I'm motivated by the prophetic. I'm motivated by praying for people. And that's how God has brought me along in this journey. And in so doing, my expression changed a little bit. So instead of telling people that cigarettes were going to kill them or stunt their growth, <sighs> I now say, you know, God really cares about you and he wants you to be healthy and he wants your whole body to be healthy. So that's part of the journey of learning how to love people. At least it's part of my journey. I would say that we have learned how to love people to our finances. It's, it's one of the very crucial ways of how we can love people. And in James, it talks about that, you know, for brothers, sisters in need, how we are to reach into our pockets and, and you know, take money out. Don't, don't just say to them, bless you and send them on their way. And I really have been so blessed to have witnessed this in this past year. You know, during a lockdown and, um, you know, with all of us just being, um, it's, it's like we're sequestered in our homes and, and not having the freedoms that we had. I want to say that I was so incredibly blessed. I have seen people just giving of their finances and their resources to others. I had, um, you know, I've connect groups. I lead the women's community here at Catch the Fire. And I have had uh, some of my leaders would just randomly call me and say, oh, uh, you know, the so-and-so needed something. I just went and bought some groceries, dropped it off for them. Or, you know, I just went and gave them some money. I had um, someone in December around Christmas time um, use me, not use me, but 
yes, utilize me as a conduit for passing money over to people. They said, look, we're going to email you some money. We want you to give it to this person, that person. Just don't tell them who it's from. I had a young man who was uh, quite successful in business, who um, came to me and gave me an envelope with money. And he says, look, I had the greatest encounter with God in this past year, and I have been so successful, and I put aside money. I want to help people who are poor. I want to help people. Here's money. Just, you know, just give it to them. So I want to say thank you, God, and bless you. I know in the greater body of Christ that all of you have been stretched, but you have been giving of your finances, and that's a way that we can love others. We have come a long ways also in loving those of different religions. We've come a long way in loving those of different lifestyles. And we've done so well at it because of the transformational power of Jesus Christ in us. Amen? Well, thank you, Lord. We're so thankful for that. I want to talk about two people in the Bible. Thank God it's from the Bible. Um, and how... One of them learned, I don't know that he actually get, got to the place of love right away, but it was a very difficult situation for him. And in this, how he allowed God to activate his spiritual gift so that he could be a blessing to someone. Now, this whole story is multifaceted and it's multidimensional, but I want to kind of hone in on a certain part of it today, if that's okay. It's just so incredible. It's, it's so full, but the part that caught me was how God used one man to bless another and how he used his, his, his uh, spiritual gift to bring freedom and deliverance to another one. So we're going to go um, into Acts chapter 9. And I'm sure most of you already know where we're headed. Acts chapter 9. I'll give you a preamble of the first part, and then I will start um, reading from, I will read from verse 10. So the preamble is, we've got Saul, and he's been the greatest persecutor of the Christians, of the believers and the disciples of Jesus in that time. And in Jerusalem, he was, he was just railing them in, bringing them into prison, and, um, and, and he was gaining favor from all the religious leaders. So he went to them and asked for a special letter now to go to Damascus. And he's like, I'm going to go there. I'm going to drag these Christians back and bring them back and make them lion food. So he gets uh, his companions with him, and he's headed up to Damascus. And what happens? On that road, Jesus meets him. Jesus comes like a light from, from heaven. Bright light shines all around Saul. What happens? He falls on his face and he hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, who is this? And the voice says, it's me, Jesus. And, and Saul is on the ground and he gets up, but he can't see. He's blind. And his companions take a hold of his hand and they lead him to Damascus. And it says, we're going we're gonna to pick up the story here. It says, for three days he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. Now, we don't know why it was three days. Maybe God was trying to mobilize one of his disciples that was not listening. And that's why Saul was there three days without sight. We don't really know why. But we want to pick up the story in verse 10. And here we go. Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, <laughs> I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind up all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself show, will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the way here, has sent me 
so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his, light, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This story is actually a supernatural story from the beginning to the end. Supernatural of what happened to Saul on the road. Supernatural of Ananias coming and laying hands on him, him, him regaining his sight and being converted, being baptized, being filled with the Holy Spirit. But was Ananias willing to do this? Was he willing to allow God to use him as a vessel to carry spiritual gifts inside of him, whatever spiritual gifting he had, so that he could go and pray for Saul? Ananias was not willing. But there was one key verse here. It's actually not a verse. It's a principle within, within this, this scripture. Ananias did not immediately have a lot of love for Saul. He actually had a quite a lot of disdain for him and he was disappointed. God, you're asking me to go and pray for this man, this evil man. That's what he said. Do you know the evil that this man has done? But the one key thing that Ananias did was he obeyed God. When we are followers of Jesus, we are called to obey him. We are called to emulate Jesus. We're called to be like Jesus. And here's Ananias and he says, okay. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go God. So he arrives at the house and what does he do? The first thing he does is he says, brother Saul. Now, why is Ananias calling him brother? He's just, he is, he's repulsed by this man. Why is he calling him brother? Well, it could be that in the, in the Jewish custom of the day, Jewish people would call each other brother and sister. And for non-Jewish people, they would call them neighbor. But is there something else? Is there a softening of Ananias' heart toward this man? Or did Ananias grab a hold of the word that God said to him? I am going to use this man. He's going to suffer many things to me. And he is going to be a leader in the church. What is it? We don't know because the scriptures don't tell us. But Ananias was obedient. We don't know how long it took him to get there. We don't know how long he wrestled with God. We don't know how long Ananias had been praying for more disciples to come to the church of Damascus. We don't know how many people are in the church at that time. What do we know? Did, did he have a gift of healing? Was he already carrying a gift of healing? Or was this an opportunity where God was going to use him to heal someone? Is this going to be the first time he was going to step into a place of seeing Holy Spirit come through him and heal someone? Come on, do you remember the first time that you laid hands on somebody and they got healed? I have to tell you, it's got to be one of the most exciting things. I actually jumped up and down and yelled and squealed because Jesus came and used me to heal someone. And here's Ananias. He goes and he calls him Brother Saul. And he's not really loving him at this moment, but a good start is obeying. So if you find it hard to love someone, I want to say, why don't you start by obeying when the Lord speaks to you? I've had to learn that story. I've had to learn that lesson myself. So this morning, I want to ask you, who is your Saul? Whoa. And I want to ask another question. Who is your Ananias? You're waiting for your Ananias to come. Or are you Ananias? And who is your Saul today? That's just a, a little question I want you to ref reflect on. And if you feel so led, you can put something in the chat and you can let us know how you feel about that. And I feel like that's a Holy Spirit question to you today. What was it about, about Saul? Was he unlovable? You know, we say sometimes, uh, love the unlovable. But when we use that terminology, unlovable, it almost denotes that it is impossible to love that person. And I want to say, I don't think it's impossible because God has shown us that. And we've seen many stories in the Bible. No one uh, is unlovable. I like the term hard to love. What does that mean, hard to love? Well, 
Sometimes it means that the person is really complex and it's a little bit of a journey to get into their hearts. But once you get there, when you're able to penetrate their hearts through the love that you can demonstrate to them and the love of Jesus through you, then you can, you can experience great upsides to seeing that person walk out their destiny, come into transformation and see what God will do with them in their lives. And part of that is our spiritual gifts that God has given us. I can't say that I'm the most mercy-minded person, but I want to tell you, I have a justice mind. I'm justice-motivated and justice-propelled. I love seeing God's people set free. I want to see everybody walking in their destinies. And I've had to confront my own souls in my time. So, are we disciples of Jesus? Yes, we are. And how do we walk that out? I find it so interesting that Ananias did not question God about, God, how am I supposed to go heal this man? He didn't say that at all. He did not question about what God wanted to do with this man. The only thing that bothered him was the fact that Saul was a persecutor of Christians. Can you imagine? He's like, God, seriously? Seriously, that's my favorite word. Seriously, God, were you there when people were stoning Stephen, that lovely young man who was so full of faith and forgiveness? And they lay their coats at Saul's feet like, God, do you really want me to go and now pray for this man? And everything that you've given me inside of me, I have to go and pour it out on him? I want us to take a moment and just think about that. If we were asking God that question today, who's that Saul that we are saying no to? Who's hurt you? Who's maligned you? Who's spoken evil against you? The Bible says, rejoice when they speak evil against you. Great is your reward in heaven. But while we're on the earth, we need to walk this out. So, who's the last person you would want to pray for? Who's the last person you would want to have over for a meal? Who's the last person you would want to give a prophetic word to? Who's the last person you would want to discern for or, or share a word of knowledge with? These are all gifts, spiritual gifts. Let's ask Holy Spirit that question. God anointed an Ananias for that moment so that he would go and lay hands on Saul and Saul would be filled with the Holy Spirit. He would start his destiny and he would start to walk with Jesus. How do you know who God is calling you to pray for? You know, in this season, I prayed for so many people. I cannot begin to tell you how many people message me. I get messages from every, every platform whatsoever. I'm not on, 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 on social media a whole lot. I, I haven't been on it for months because I'm just, I'm just in a different place right now. And, but so many people would message. My leaders on, in the women's community would message. So many people looking for prayer right now. We essentially do not have the right to say no to when somebody's asking for prayer and we know that we have the words of life who's Jesus himself. We need to step out and to share our gifts so that we can bring people into freedom and deliverance. I remember several years ago, Norman and I were asked by a chaplain of a correctional facility if, would be, if we would be a fill-in uh, for Sunday services. And... Um, we would come to church and then we would go home, have a quick bite to eat, and then we'd go in the afternoon. No, this didn't come about very quickly. We had to go through some intense training. We had to undergo um, testing. We had to read books about how to interact um, with, with people that are incarcerated. We had to learn all these different methods and we had to be very intentional about how we behaved when we went into the correctional center. And uh, I remember I would dress almost like a Mennonite and like no makeup and, you know, couldn't show my toes, no nail polish, nothing like that. It kind of reminded me of being in the corporate world. I, when I worked in the corporate world, we couldn't wear open toe shoes and we couldn't wear earrings, wore suits all the time, gray and white suits. But anyway, we would go in and I remember the first time that we went in, the uh, inmates would come in, the ones that wanted to come to the meeting. And then they would close the door behind them. They would sit in chairs right in front of us. They were not shackled. They were all free. And the first time we went, 
I looked at them and I knew, I cannot share details because of confidentiality, but I knew that they had committed some very horrible crimes. And as a woman being in that facility, I have to tell you, I went under the grace of God and because God said to go and do it. But the first time we went and we, and we did, and, you know, they played three songs. Uh, there are a couple of guys that played the guitar and they played a couple of songs. And, um, and then I preached a message and I prayed a nice little corporate prayer for them and bless you all. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. See you later. Goodbye. Thank you, Jesus. I'm out of here. And then the second time I went back, I was like, God, I don't want to do this clinically. I want to do this with your heart. Can you please give me love for these people? They were men, all men. Can you give me love for these men? And you know, at first it came supernaturally. God gave us a supernatural love that we went in the second time and was a little bit different. But after that time, the third time I went in, it was like I had this incredible love for these ones. And everything that God gave me, the prophetic and, and, and the ability to pray and the healing, the anointing for healing, I laid it on them. And I remember this one man came up, you know, we said, who, who has a prayer request? And they would give us all these prayer requests. And I remember one of them saying, oh my goodness, can you pray for my kids, my wife and kids? They're, they're suffering financially. I'm in here. And he started crying. And my husband goes and puts his arms around him and he hugs him and he prays for him. Now we're not allowed to do that. But I have to tell you, I couldn't help myself. I put my hands on their backs and I prayed for them. And God started to give us love. And then we were intentional about loving them. But it was quite a journey into learning how to love those that are hard to love. So how are we using our spiritual gifts to love others? How are you using yours? In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about us using our gifts for the common good. And it talks about wisdom and knowledge and healing and faith and miracles and prophecy and discernment. You can also read about in Romans chapter 12 and Ephesians chapter 4. And that talks specifically about the fivefold ministries. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. What is the gift you're carrying? Has it been lying dormant? Has it been lying dormant? Has God been speaking to you about it? Are you praying for anyone? Are you extending your hand to anyone? How are you serving the people in your community? Are you praying for non-believers? Can I say to you that we are in a ripe season that this is the time that God is calling us to pray for unbelievers. God is calling us to pray for those ones that are hard to love, the cranky man down the street that yells at you when you walk your dog, keep your dog off his lawn. That's the one God might be calling you to pray for. Maybe there's a neighbor that is, that is, in, in, you know, in, in, that is not doing well with the lockdown. I, I have to tell you, I'm not a baker. I'm not, I'm, you know, I will bake a couple of times a year, like at Christmas, you know, Christmas cookies. This year, I find myself, what I did recently, I baked a whole bunch of chocolate chip cookies and brought it to my neighbor. I am making bread. I don't even eat gluten. I am making bread, cheese bread, and all different kinds of bread. And I'm reaching out to people. I'm not, you know, my, my gifting is not great for hospitality, but I'm extending it, and I'm pushing it, and I'm stepping into it because I'm a disciple of Jesus. And I want to emulate Jesus. And in this season, I am saying that we are called to pray like we've never prayed before. And there are people that are so ripe wherever you go. Open your eyes and look. The word of God says that the harvest is ready. It is ripe. It is ready. But the workers are few. Let's use our spiritual gifts. Whatever it is that God has given to you. Will you today make an agreement and say, yes, God, will you increase it in me? I may not be able to prophesy but I have faith. I can pray for somebody in faith. God, I can encourage someone. I can exhort someone today so that they will come into deliverance and they will come into their destiny. How did Ananias know that God was going to use him to pray for Saul and look at who Saul became? He became Paul the apostle. Today, I want to say that we have ministries here. We've got a um, We've got a, a ministry, sorry, we've got a ministry team. You know, here am I, here I am. After all of these years of seeking God, chasing the anointing, 
on my knees before the Lord and saying, what did you create me for? Tell me. It took me a while to come into that place of recognizing what God had blessed me with, with the spiritual gifts. And then he said, use it. And so I use it everywhere I go, however I can. We have I'm now overseeing all the supernatural areas of our ministry, the ministry team, the house of prayer, the healing center, the prophetic team, um, and the intercession team. I want to say that if you would like to grow your gifts, we welcome you. We will make it available for you soon to be able to join one of these teams where you can hone that gift that God has given you. If it's something that is not a part of those five ministries, we have so much encouragement through our discipleship pastor, Jonathan Clark, and, and Rob McIntosh, who works with him with our connect groups, that we can help you to grow in your spiritual gifts. But today, again, I want to say, if you are Saul, then pray and ask God for that Ananias to come and find you wherever you are. Before I came into, into the acknowledgement that I was carrying a spiritual gift, I was cynical and I doubted. And it's all the places I came from and all the experiences I've had and the pain and the trauma that I've experienced. But I want to say today to you, ask the Holy Spirit, am I Saul? And is there somebody that you are releasing to come and love me even though I'm hard to love? And will they come with their spiritual gifts to come and set me free? And if you are in a place of Ananias, I want to say to you the first step, we can experience the supernatural love of God. He'll give a supernatural love for people. But there is nothing like coming into the truth and the revelation and the acknowledgement and that sobering moment of knowing that we are loving someone just because we love them for who they are. Are you Ananias? What is God saying to you today? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Open your eyes. Look for that street. Where is that person that is waiting for you to come and lay hands on them? Where is that person in your life? Maybe they're on the phone. Maybe they're by Zoom. Maybe they're by some video, some kind of video platform. Maybe it's a parking lot coffee date on a Sunday afternoon where you park, uh, you know, 12 feet away from each other and you are able to minister to that person. I have had all kinds of opportunities, as I said, to pray for people and I'm so thankful for it. I've had opportunities to disciple people. I've had opportunities to prophesy over people. But the one key here is that when we do this, we are pointing them straight at Jesus. Our position in loving others is to bring them to Jesus and to point them to Jesus where they become empowered by knowing Jesus in that deep way and experiencing him. I want us to really, really ask the Holy Spirit today where we're positioned. Who is it that we're avoiding? Who's the Saul in our lives? Who's the Ananias in our lives? And how can we use our spiritual gifts so that we can be a blessing to love other people, and to bring them to Jesus so that they too can experience deep transformation through knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you have chosen us and that you've chosen to endow us with great gifts. You have chosen us, O Lord God, and you have imparted and anointed us with so many different spiritual gifts. And we ask today, Father, that you will use us as your vessels. God, we surrender. We submit to you and we surrender and we say, God, until our hearts engage with love, will you please help us to obey you? Because in obedience to you, Lord God, we are demonstrating our love for you. And your commandment says, love the Lord your God and then love others. So God, we ask today that wherever we came from, if we're struggling with receiving love or if we're struggling with demonstrating love, Father God, that you would come. You would heal those parts of our hearts, oh Lord God. And you will give us courage and you will make us brave, oh Lord God, that we will choose to love again and we will choose to love others. 
Father God, we ask that as we pray the praise of faith, that you will come and that you will respond. We ask God as we lay hands on the sick that they will recover. The cry of our hearts, oh God, today is that we will see you come again in signs and in wonders and in miracles that we will experience the supernatural, oh Lord God, among us. We ask, oh God, that when you would move on our hearts to share wisdom, that we will step into it, oh God. We ask, Father God, that you will continue to give us if we are endowed with, this, with the gift of generosity that you would come and God, that you would increase it in us. Oh God, we surrender to you today and we say thank you. Thank you for the opportunities that you are placing before us on the earth in this hour. Thank you for every heart that is crying out, Lord God, that's waiting to be loved, oh Lord God, and to see a demonstration of the heart of Jesus through his disciples. We thank you, Father. We bless you. And we say, come, change our hearts today. Come, O oh Lord God, where we've dug our heels in and said, I don't want to pray for anybody else. I don't want to prophesy for anybody, over anybody. God, we say in Jesus' name, will you come and deal with us and what's going on in our own hearts and empower us once again, O oh God, that we will, we will show off Jesus and God, that many will turn to him and come and surrender their lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Will you help us to walk in integrity with the gifts? Will you help us, O oh Lord God, to honor the anointing? Will you help us, O oh Lord God, to exercise it and to give wholeheartedly, as it says in 1 Peter, it is for the good of all. And we are to serve one another with it. We thank you, Jesus, and we bless you. And we say thank you for trusting us with the gifts. And thank you for trusting us with your heart. And thank you for trusting us with, Lord God, with the, with the world today. May we truly bring in the harvest through all that you've done through us. We pray this in your precious name, Jesus. And we say we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We love you, Jesus, because we love you. We choose to love others. Friends, feel free to keep putting your thoughts in the chat. And if you would like some more prayer, as I said, We've got a ministry team here that's ready and waiting for you. And they pray with passion. They pray with love. And they give of themselves every Sunday. They're online doing this. All you need to do, they might be um, online. You will see the link. But it's if you would like prayer, you can go to ctftoronto.com front slash get prayer now. And someone will be happy to pray with the heart of Jesus for you. And just deliver everything that Holy Spirit gives to them for you today. So that you can be free, delivered, and walk out the fullness of your destiny on this earth. I bless you all. May this coming week be a week where you get the opportunity to use all of your spiritual gifts and to see the hand of God move through you. Bless you all in Jesus' name. Amen.